Mm. Hello and welcome to Intuitive Conversations with Tamara and Chantel. I'm Chantel. I'm Tamara. <laughs> and today we wanted to talk about triggers. Um, it feels like a timely topic because with everything that's been going on around COVID and um, information and vaccines and uh, just life in general, it feels like a timely topic. Lots of people are being triggered by things in the news, triggered by restrictions being imposed, restrictions being lifted, vaccinations and all kinds of things. Um, but in general, you know, triggers is, uh, I think it's always a timely topic because when we think about how we handle vulnerability in those places where we feel most tender, um, most exposed, the, the triggers are kind of the, the things that let us know that uh, those soft spots are there. We spend a lot of time and energy trying to um, push our triggers away, trying to avoid triggers. Mm -hmm. So before we uh, started recording this conversation, we were having uh, a talk about the movie Inside Out, <laughs> which is yeah. one of our favorite movies. It seems to apply to everything that we talk about yeah. in the podcast. Uh, but Chantal, if you want to um, kind of capture what you were explaining about triggers and inside out. Well, yeah, well, we're talking about different parts of ourselves and in parts therapy, they, there are exiles, which are like um, inner child parts, which carry the emotion. And um, on the movie Inside Out, there are those, you know, there's fear and anger and they had disgust. I wish they had guilt instead of disgust, but that's oh. okay. That's cool because guilt is a is a biggie. Yeah. And uh, shame, guilt, and yeah, shame. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then they had sadness, and in the end, sadness is what landed up saving the day because it brought down those walls, helped her be vulnerable with her parents, and you know said why she ran away and why she was upset yeah. to begin with, and, yeah. and all that. Yeah, I've been listening to a lot of Christina Lopes on YouTube, um, lately one of my favorite spiritual teachers, and uh, a statement she made a while back that really was arresting to me was, triggers are our best friends. <laughs> and I had never thought of it that way, but what you were just saying about sadness, um, and you know, we were talking before we came on the air about how those other parts of the, the girl in the movie, the anger, and joy, they kept taking over. And anytime sadness was was triggered and started to cry, they would redirect or they would, you know, try to come up with some kind of a plan. And they just wanted to bubble wrap the sadness and, and keep sadness at bay. And uh, what you were just saying about how sadness in the end got at all of the underlying issues and helped her resolve her feelings and everything, it, it just made me realize that. Um, the triggers take us into our authenticity if we let them. Mm -hmm. and, and they all have a positive purpose. Yeah. How authentic can we be when we are pushing away parts of ourselves that we don't want to deal with? Mm -hmm. And we think we're doing a great job of covering that other people won't see. Um, but I think most people can sense when there's a part of us that we are sort of keeping under wraps. And it's... Um... It brings such a, I don't know, it just it builds rapport, I guess. Like, or you could say, hey, you feel that? Oh, me too. Mm -hmm. You know, like it takes down all the walls just instantaneously when someone can be fully authentic and vulnerable and just say, this is how I feel about this. Like, it's, it's not pleasant. <laughs> that connects so closely with, uh, I had my Brene Brown book here. I've been reading a lot about vulnerability um, and I left it open because I knew we would be talking about triggers today. And this quote here, she says, um, um, in this chapter about vulnerability and the armory, like all the armor that we use to protect ourselves from vulnerability and how we're conditioned to sort of look at the world in a dual, we, we kind of divide all people into Vikings and victims. God forbid you should be a victim. So we're all going to be Vikings and armor ourselves and protect our vulnerability. But she says, when we teach or model to our children that vulnerability is dangerous and should be pushed away, 
we lead them directly into danger and disconnection. Mm -hmm. Because how can you be seen when there's this part of you that you're hiding away, that you won't let into the light of day and you're, you know, you're keeping it in some dark corner. You're always going to go around with that feeling of disconnection that they think they know me, but they don't really know me because there's this part of me that I won't let them see because I'm, I'm too afraid they won't accept me. You know, mm -hmm. so that feeling of disconnection, I think, is so pervasive. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we were talking about um, like vaccines and how that can be triggering for people on, on either side. And just a spoiler, Tamara and I don't have the same opinions on it. <laughs> and we're still friends so <laughs> just to let you know fyi it is possible to to continue being friends with someone who doesn't share the exact same view mm -hmm. there's so much fear going on on both sides the, the fear paradigm and i think we've been able to both step out of that even though we've ended up making different decisions regarding it mm -hmm. so yeah it's um, one of my favorite things to do when I'm triggered is to say, isn't that interesting? You know, like, or I wonder, blah, blah, blah. Cause it, yeah. it puts you in the place of the observer, mm -hmm. you know, it, it helps you step out of the story of fear or the story of lack. Yeah. And I love that because it not only gives you distance and some objectivity, but it also, um, if you're mindful that you're doing that, then you realize I'm so much larger than this part of me that is disturbed by or is triggered by whatever it is. Um, we've talked a bit about the untethered soul. That is like my favorite book now. <laughs> like it's uh, like my and, Bible. Like I love it. Oh, so much great stuff. Like this is the book that you read, you know, a page a night or something and digest slowly and then go back and read it again and again and again. But one of the um, disciplines in here, just a, um, an easy discipline to adopt because it's very simple, but completely paradigm shifting is that when something's triggering you, um, not to say, how can I solve this problem? How can I deal with this problem? How can I um, get this problem out of my, <laughs> away from me? Uh, he says, ask yourself, what part of me is disturbed by this problem? Mm -hmm. So that not only kind of puts a different perspective on it, but it lets you know it is only part of me that's yeah, triggered puts you by in this the place thing. Of the observer, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I recently watched the Sedona method, uh, which is available on YouTube. It's just uh, over an hour. Fascinating movie. Um, the Sedona method is a method for releasing a lot of things. Um, but there's this beautiful practice. It's it's a welcoming practice. It's a three-part practice. And what you do is whatever is triggering you, what, whatever problem is in your mental space at the moment, you just um, do a three-part welcoming. So the first welcome is whatever feelings, beliefs, or thoughts come up with that issue, you just let them arise. So almost as if you're a host and you're welcoming them to the party in your house or on your yacht or whatever, just at the door, oh, here's fear, welcome, come on in. Here's shame, you know, here's disappointment, whatever. Um, here's this negative belief that I have that I'm not worthy enough, that I'm not competent, that I'm comparing myself to my colleagues, all, all of those things. You just welcome them and let them arise. And then the second welcome is uh, you welcome any need you have to deal with the problem, to push it away or to hold it close to yourself. And the third welcome is you welcome any idea that this is about who you are, about your identity and who you are as a person. And I find that by the time I've done that three-part welcome, I am in such an enlarged, expanded version of myself that most of what was bothering me has kind of dropped away. And uh, so that is a simple, beautiful practice that you can easily do in a few minutes as you're in traffic, standing in line, whatever. But yeah, you again, did it with like, me, and I remember like you having my hands move apart slowly, and just how that really helped yeah. me just make more room for for everything. Yeah, I love it. Yeah, that the book. Going back to the book, the uh, Untethered Soul, 
my favorite thing about it or what stuck with me most there's many great things that took a lot of notes but the thing that stuck with me most was the idea that um like we're making our minds work too much like we wonder why we have so much anxiety and we're giving our mind an impossible task the impossible task of making us happy all the time of making other people happy all the time of making sure nothing happens in our world that could remotely make us upset in any way um like we've literally given our mind an impossible task and so the mind is trying really hard like the computer mind is trying really hard to do all these things but what if we didn't give that the mind the impossible task of making everything perfect for us all the time if yeah. it was okay to feel those feelings if it was okay that we had a bad day like if it was okay if all of these things were okay and it's a similar concept to welcoming it makes it okay which may, takes the resistance out of it which makes the body the nervous system come back to neutral yeah so it strikes me that the reason it we're giving the mind an impossible task is because 90% of the issues that we're obsessing about were created by the mind in the first place. Mm -hmm. And the mind How can't solve <laughs> the mind can't solve its own problems. Yeah. So in, in IFS parts therapy, those would be the protective parts of us. <laughs> like Yeah. Just it's working funny. overtime to to make us <laughs> not feel those things, right? <laughs> So as an illustration, um, on the weekend, last weekend, uh, just before the weekend, I had had some blood tests done a few weeks ago and hadn't heard anything and it, it completely had gone out of my mind. And then all of a sudden we're sitting down eating supper and on a Thursday evening, the clinic calls and the doctor is there late. She must have been uh, catching up on paperwork, whatever. And um, she wanted me to go and redo uh, a blood test because my white count was a little low. So of course, being a cancer survivor, my mind goes immediately to, um, is it a recurrence? You know, my dad had leukemia, is it that? And just, um, you know, a million directions. Whereas um, a minute before that, it was not an issue at all, but now a new possibility has been introduced and my mind immediately starts creating this, you know, these catastrophic scenarios. And uh, from that moment on, anytime my body did anything all weekend, it's like, oh, is that a sign that this is, you know, this thing or, and it was just, I, I'm aware enough now to be able to sort of take a half step back and look at what my mind is doing and saying, isn't that insane? That, um... <laughs> or maybe, isn't that interesting? Might be a little bit better. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yes. Yes. There's the judgy mind going the judgy insane. Part. <laughs> Yeah. But, you know, a new possibility is introduced and all of a sudden the mind just takes it and runs with it. And it didn't have to mean anything. Um, and I specifically said, I'm not going on the internet to do the research because <laughs> I know what my mind will do with that research. And, and they say, stay away from yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then a few days later, you know, I, I had the test redone, got the results and it was normal. And, and then the mind immediately is like, okay, now I can relax. And it was just so instructive to see, you know, the drama, the complete and total drama went through a, a, a complete cycle. Mm -hmm. And it and was all in my mind. If anyone had tried to tell you, like, don't feel that way, or, you know, if anyone had tried to tell you in the moment, you would have had, like, you know, such resistance or, like, mm -hmm. how you're rude being crazy. of them. Yeah, yeah. Been, you're like, overreacting. Yeah. Yeah. But in mind doesn't you know, handle that well. <laughs> yeah, like when you believe a story, like really, we're all we're all at some point or another living or believing a story from the past or maybe from the future that isn't true. Like anxiety is the future, right? And um, oh, I forget what the quote is about the past and the future, but like basically not living in the now. Right. Yeah. So um, how does that go? Regret is judging the past or something that anxiety is worrying about the future mm -hmm. yeah but if we're just in the present moment like for example today it's a beautiful day outside right so i could just go outside and soak up the sunshine and enjoy nature enjoy the little kids running around you know like 
enjoy all that. Or I could just be like, oh, COVID, you know, <laughs> what are the million things that could go wrong? <laughs> And I'm human, I do that, right? Everyone does that. Mm -hmm. But we, we still have a choice to, to enjoy the present or to mm -hmm. let our mind yeah. go. It's really interesting. Um, I mean, we're grown adults, um, but we're sort of living in an era where even as grown adults, we're trying to train people not to step on our triggers. And like for somebody who's in the academic community, all the stories about professors who are told you can't talk about this in your class that might be triggering to you know this segment of your student body or even in high school you know in in the area where we live there are certain hot topics um in the bible that you don't necessarily want to spend too much time talking about evolution or you know um at what point do we grow up as a society and say hey we all have different viewpoints on things mm -hmm. and it's okay to to talk about things and it's okay to be triggered by things mm -hmm. because how do we know what's lurking down there underneath the surface if we never allow ourselves to be triggered by anything mm -hmm. and I, I mean a trigger when Christina well, looks why... oh go ahead <laughs> uh when she says triggers are our best friends really they are because they let us know what needs to be healed mm -hmm. Now that is the way in that's that's how you find healing is to step into it mm -hmm. instead of resisting right? yeah yeah mm -hmm. as a teacher it's been tricky sometimes when you go to choose a novel to read with your students um and you may have a student who's had a traumatic experience or who has lost loved ones and then do i read a novel that has a death in it mm -hmm. and um at, at a certain point in my career, I probably would have avoided, I know I have avoided those kinds of topics for fear of triggering a student. And now, depending on the age of the student and, you know, the, the class that I have and so on, I'm sort of saying it's okay sometimes for there to be an opening into those tender places because if it never gets talked about, if, if it never, if we never allow the triggers to show us where we need healing, we just go through life and kind of um, we're not operating on all cylinders. We're, you know. Yeah. Well, the message that we were, we were taught growing up and I think most of society was, was that, you know, it's supposed to be a good life. If it's not, it's not a good experience, there's something wrong with you or something wrong in general. Um, but that's just simply not the case. I feel like we're here to evolve, to level up, to learn. And we learn through challenges. Any movie, any book, you're going to find some sort of challenge to overcome. Like you, you love the hero's journey, right? Yeah. And the, I feel like the more we can look at our lives as the hero's journey and look at our lives as, a, isn't that interesting? I'm in this stage mm -hmm. now, you know, like, what is there to learn about this rather than why is this happening to me? <laughs> right? And if you think about it, it's not much of a story, right? If there's never a trigger, if nothing, yeah, it'd be boring. there's never, you I mean, never they enjoy the, the rainbow without the rain, right? <laughs> and the whole point of the hero's journey is to go down into that dark cave where everyone fears to go. Mm -hmm. I love um, like Brene Brown and Martha Beck, two of my favorite people both trained sociologists they have different words that they use um Bernice brown uh, her term is wholehearted living mm -hmm. so i don't think you can live wholeheartedly when you're keeping parts of yourself down in the cave mm -hmm. where they'll never see the light of day mm -hmm. and martha beck uh, whose latest book is the way of integrity she'll talk about how we let ourselves be taken out of integrity when we hide those parts away mm -hmm. so you know we can't experience the fullness of life when we're, we're keeping parts of ourselves bubble wrapped yeah like when you you know say to your friend like how are you doing oh good good no oh, how are you oh, oh it's all good right is it really i've started to say you know like how was my weekend it was good and bad you know and ah. i don't always go into it sometimes i do but when i do it definitely creates a bit a more connection than if i just said yeah it's all good right because then the other person is going to be like oh well, i guess i should say all good too because if i don't you know like yeah it's a bit <laughs> of a tricky thing right because 
how much of a conversation do you want to get into with everybody who asks you that? Because that's just kind of second nature to say, hi, how are you? Mm -hmm. um, and Martha Beck talks about, like, she spent a year, she made a, a resolution to not lie to anybody for a, an entire year. I think she was 29 or something. And it, even about things like that, someone asks you how your day is and you're, you don't say good if it's not good. But then mm -hmm. you have to decide how much do you want to give to that person? And you, sometimes you it's a question. You have to explain it. You can yeah. just say it wasn't the best yeah. day. Like it's just been one of those days. That's still cool to say. Oh <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah. But it's, yeah, it's interesting. Just, it's been an interesting journey through this COVID just sort of watching and, and paying attention to what triggers people. I'll talk about one of my biggest triggers. I'm trying to remember when it exactly was. Um, I think it was in the winter. But anyways, it was my trigger was when um, I thought that my friends or my family would like tattle on me to the government or whatever that like my kid came home for Christmas, you know, like my, mm. my 20 year old kid came home for Christmas when we weren't allowed. Right. And that like triggered me because in my past, you know, like getting in trouble was a huge deal number one but like tattling was I don't know just <laughs> so many stories come up around mm -hmm. around that like it's it's like a betrayal right like mm -hmm. trust is broken and so I just cried like the whole day I was just like you know like I just couldn't I couldn't believe it because like to me like loyalty is such a big thing and I, I would never you know tattle on my friend for 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 anything like I feel like people are doing the best they can whatever they choose like they're doing you know mm -hmm. there's a narrative going around saying that like oh this group of people is choosing this and that makes them bad guys because they're making everybody else you know be unsafe somehow mm -hmm. but I I feel like that's a very um you know it creates war like it creates people like good guys, bad guys, but I don't see mm -hmm. people as good guys, bad guys. Yeah. I see people I as think, trying yeah. their best. And that is a result of, um, you know, when we're triggered, not handling triggers mindfully, because it's so easy to just project, right? I mean, a trigger is always, it's always pointing to the place where you're vulnerable. So that feeling of vulnerability is, you know, so fear-based. We, we want to do everything to protect ourselves from being vulnerable. So counterattacking is one of our go-tos. I blame. You know? Yeah. Oh, it's your fault. Yeah. This wouldn't be happening if you That's would That's a protective just... part. Blame is a protective part to make the, the exile part not feel like bad about like that they did something wrong. So in order to make to make the exile not feel bad, the protector has to blame someone else, whether or not it's true. Yeah. Um, another um, strategy for dealing with triggers that I really like is the tapping. Mm, also so called emotional freedom technique, which just that, you know, tapping the different meridian points. Um, and the research shows that, you know, it, it um, calms the amygdala. The first step of Which that is, is accepting what's happening, accepting yeah. the, you know, like, <laughs> and, and loving yeah. yourself through it. Yeah. Like, even though, even though this bad thing is happening, even though I feel this way, even though they did this to me, you know, like I truly love and accept myself and just yeah. over and over and yeah. even though this and this, like, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like imagine okay. the, imagine the movie inside out. If the characters would have handled the situation like that. Even though sadness is bubbling up right now, I choose to fully love, accept and honor myself, mm. you know? And it brings you right back into integrity because there's no hiding what's going on. Even though I feel like I've really let myself down, um, I still choose to love, honor, accept and forgive myself, mm -hmm. yeah, you know? Exactly. And that really helps with the inner self-talk, <laughs> you mm -hmm. know? I have this um, journal, like it's a journal that you fill out and um, there's four sections in it every day. And one of the sections is 
choosing to honor other people or choosing to honor yourself for those choices that you don't quite understand right mm. so like you can just write today I choose to honor those who make a different decision than me regarding the vaccine or yeah anything and yeah. you know I choose to honor myself for the choice that I made with the you know <laughs> information I had right because it's hard to know sometimes if you're making the right decision mm -hmm. um but honoring is another way of welcoming and accepting too mm -hmm. and it takes the resistance out of life yeah which makes the yeah. nervous system feel good again and that's really all we want is to feel good again yeah like i feel that um a lot of the vaccine stuff is like a, a shot in the arm of like courage <laughs> right like mm -hmm. it's taking away the fear that's plaguing people for for like over a year and um I, I see it almost as a virtue thing too, like a shot of virtue. Like I'm, I'm doing the best for humanity, yeah. right? Like, <laughs> yep. But when you think of it in parts, it makes sense of why it could make someone feel good. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And so understanding where people are coming from is such a huge thing for acceptance. Yeah, yeah. and that's such a great discipline understand. too. Like that, that takes me back again to Brene Brown and her basic question of, um, do I choose to believe that everyone is doing the best they can? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And one of my triggers too is <laughs> on social media and it just keeps getting stronger and stronger to the point where I've been staying off of social media. I've been posting my quotes and stuff, but I've been staying off of reading it because it's just all I'm seeing is this virtue stuff. Like I did this, so I'm better. You know, uh, from both sides, yeah. from mm -hmm. both sides. Yeah. And it's so divisive and yeah, it's it's triggering. Yeah. <laughs> and judgment so, is a huge trigger for me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But I mean, I understand where people are coming from. It's just one of those things, right? And so then, yeah. then I dive in, then I talk to my therapist and I go through these, like the welcoming thing that you're saying, or I go through the IFS parts therapy, or I go into the symbolic yeah. metaphors and it's just really calming or EFT. Yeah, I have that yeah. app on my phone, the EFT yeah. tapping app, it's awesome. Yeah. It's even that question, <laughs> even Michael Singer's question, what part of me is disturbed by this or triggered by this? Um, because anything that triggers us um, is is an unhealed wound, mm -hmm. and and the the point where we're judging others, I mean, judgment comes from triggering. Mm -hmm. If you're not triggered by anything, there's never a need to judge other people. So the minute I find myself judging somebody, I I kind of need to go back, walk myself backward a little bit, and say, you know, what part of me is triggered by that person that I feel the need to. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it doesn't on. necessarily make it our fault that they did a bad thing, but it does um, like make it make us more empowered that we can do something to make ourselves feel better about the situation mm -hmm. versus waiting for their apology or, you know, that will never come <laughs> or anything like that. Yeah. Yeah. The more tools we can have to to feel better about, you know, our triggers. The biggest lesson to me in my journey of becoming a therapist and i keep learning but the biggest biggest lesson of all is that life is good and bad it's black and white or not black and white it's yin yang like you have to have mm. both things like in order to solve your issue and be okay mm -hmm. again you have to go into the dark part you have to go into the shadow you have to go into the trigger like what part of me is disturbed by this? You have to work through that in order to come out again on the other side in order to resolve that issue, in order mm -hmm. to level up if it was a video game yeah. to evolve, like yeah. to learn and a I lesson think, from the thing. And what I'm learning as I get older and older is that it doesn't have to be hard. No. It doesn't have to be a long, difficult process, mm -hmm. you know, um, to to get at some of these things. Like even that, Sedona method of just sitting and welcoming whatever arises, all of a sudden I realize I'm the host of everything that's going on within Never, me, which yeah. means I'm bigger than all of it. Mm -hmm. And that and helped me through it, grief. Man, did that help yeah. me through grief. And the minute I just let it arise and say, welcome, mm -hmm. all of a sudden it's not as powerful. Like we're so afraid that if we go into our triggers, we're gonna be overwhelmed with mm -hmm. all of the feelings that we've been suppressing 
-hmm. and we won't be able to function or we're, you know, we're going to fall apart. We're going to be a mess, whatever. Mm -hmm. And maybe and for like a few we're minutes. We're afraid of being be. embarrassment or whatever. Yeah. I remember um, trying to make a long story short. I was in like several years ago in this circle, we had gotten together on a like regular basis as a group of like 10 people. And we were saying goodbye to each other and going around the circle saying, you know, just expressing our gratitude. And when it got to me and I had the talking stick, I teared up. And then the, you know, all of my inner things are just like, oh no, I'm so embarrassed. And just so much resistance, right? And that made me cry more. And the leader just said, tears are a welcome visitor. And that just like took it all away. I didn't feel like crying anymore. I was like, oh yeah, this is chill, right? Like Wonderful. <laughs> it totally yeah. neutralized it to accept mm -hmm. it. Yeah. And like yeah. Uh, another story that comes up that I quickly want to share. Um, I might've told you this one before, but like, because I'm, I'm a therapist and I've been doing the feeding your demons process with my clients a lot, it kind of became second nature to me. So much so that, when I was in the shower and my kid had bought this soap that had the same smell of, of the soap that my mouth was washed out with soap with it when I was a kid. As soon as I picked it up and started like using it, it started smelling like that. And oh, was I triggered. <sighs> and I was just like, okay, I'm gonna go into this and just diving into this, right? And so it's just like, close my eyes and like, what do you want from me? What do you need from me? How will you feel when you get what you need? dissolve my body into the nectar that has the quality of the feeling that would have got what it needs, fed it the nectar. It shifted, like it totally just transformed, went through that yin yang sort of mm -hmm. process into the dark and, and out again through the light. And I can use that soap now, yeah. no problem. It doesn't trigger me anymore. Wow. If I had resisted it and like ran away from yeah. it and said, I'm never buying that soap again, like that can get out of hand <laughs> when you have triggers oh. like, yeah. Oh, I could go into stories of, um, yeah, like if, for example, <laughs> I'm not saying I know anyone who is like this, but if someone was afraid of a certain song or a certain singer, hearing that in the mall, that would make them not go into the mall. You know what I mean? Like it can, mm -hmm. it, the anxieties and the shutting off of your triggers can get so bad that you are, you can land up just on the couch, like never leaving your home mm -hmm. because you could be triggered by something. And what yeah. kind of a life is that? And every time you're, you know, trying to shut down a trigger, you shut down a little more of your life energy. Mm. And the, um, uh, you know, it's like trying to hold someone in a, in a, you know, in a little space under the floor and you're standing on the, the trap door and they're trying to push up and you're trying to keep it down. And the energy that it takes to just keep tamping down all the triggers, all the emotions, you know, just think of how powerful we could be, the things that we could do in our lives if we freed up all of the energy that we use to try and keep those triggers under wrap. And it's not so bad. People think it's gonna be so bad if you go to therapy and you feel all those things, or they think it's gonna be so bad if you um, like meditate. You know, people are afraid of meditating because when they do, then all of a sudden all that energy is has a way out. It's just like, oh good, we can be released now. We can be felt and released because that's how you, you know, you feel to heal, right? Um, and that's why I love hypnotherapy so much is it's not just talk therapy. Talk therapy brings it up and leaves it square in front of your face. So when you're leaving, you're just like having to recover from it for a week. At least that was my experience. But in hypnotherapy and other, you know, therapies um, that are a little outside the box, you can release all of those feelings. And mm -hmm. the best way I have to release them is to visualize the elements. Like you can uh, visualize fire burning up the thing you don't want you can visualize mm -hmm. water washing it away mm -hmm. you can visualize a wind you know like you can bury it in the ground like there's there's lots of different ways that you can visualize releasing of emotion mm -hmm. yeah I mean feeding your demons is a really powerful one mm -hmm. I love journaling or using active imagination to just have a dialogue with you know whatever it is that trigger that comes up or if you have a nightmare you know, whatever image in the nightmare that the masked man that was running after you or whatever, like, what if you just turn around and say, what do you want from me? Yeah, Why exactly. Are like, Why what are if it's not as scary? Like, what if it's, you know, like, oh, there was this one story of like a guy was, was 
um, like following a girl, but he had no ill intent. But in her mind, he had ill intent, right? Like, and if he had only, she had only just been like, like, what do you want from me? Like, she, she would have been like, oh, I'm just going over there to that coffee shop. Like, no big, right? Yeah. <laughs> Not that yeah. people should do that, but that's just a metaphor. And that's, and why did she have that assumption? Yeah. Because whatever it was triggering in her mm -hmm. was a filter that she was, you know, all of her life experience was coming to her through that filter. And our protectors are there to keep us safe. And, mm -hmm. you know, they're there for a reason. We, we do need those protective parts sometimes, but as long as they're in balance, it, it goes better for us. Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah. I had yeah, another story so come up, but I'm, I don't even remember what it is now. <laughs> that's okay. Can be for well, that's a lot to chew on already. So yeah, uh, yeah. No, I just, I just like the subject of triggers and just going into it and like that. That's the way out instead of the repressing or the rejecting. That is not the way out. That's that's a way to like <laughs> you're stuffing all your energy in, and that creates blockage of energy in your body, yeah. and then health issues arise. That's and I good. think too, like if we are each on our own hero's journey and we all want to take that journey to becoming a hero, we have to stop expecting the world to protect us from our triggers. It's not anyone's job around me to protect me from the triggers that mm. keep me from going into my vulnerability and healing the places in myself that I need to heal. Yeah. And so many things that you know, we thought were wrong or bad or even, I don't know, like, I'm just thinking of myself as a young mother and little kids, they, they fight like young cubs do, right? They just tussle and tumble. And, and the young mother, as a young mother, I was very triggered by that, right? By any conflict. And I would just try to shut it down, make everyone go to their room, like not have any resolution. And it frustrated my kids you know, and frustrated my teens, like, mom, there's more than just the light, like, <laughs> embrace all things, right? It was, I mean, I finally learned the lesson now that my kids are pretty much almost grown, so. Yeah, it's kind of too bad that things <laughs> happen in that order, right? Because we all have kids when we still haven't reached that mindfulness mm -hmm. to be able to handle our own triggers, and so. We're kids, kids raising kids. They become the ones that push the buttons and and activate the triggers and then they they deal with the fact that there are all these places in ourselves that we haven't managed to heal yet so mm -hmm. but then that gives us a little more compassion for our own parents and how they exactly, <laughs> how they right? visited their triggers on us yeah like they were kids raising kids too yeah they were people with triggers yeah <laughs> and they didn't know how to handle yeah. them yeah but we have so many more tools now. Oh, I remember so, what I was going to say now. <laughs> go for it. The journaling. You can be your own therapist if you ask yourself questions and then answer them. You can be the witness of your own life. But to me, mm. like, I feel that's such an empowering thing to tell people. Like, you can literally just ask a question and then answer it. And one of my favorite quotes, too, is like, we are both the guru and the mental patient like nobody has it all together we always have advice for someone else we think yeah. these people writing books are know it all and are perfect all the time no they're not <laughs> not any more than we are you know we have good advice yeah. for people too and yet we can't seem to get our shit together half the time like it's it's human and it's okay yeah <laughs> and isn't it interesting <laughs> isn't it interesting yes <laughs> place of observation and not judgment and resistance yeah so that's a good note to end on. Yes, it is. <laughs> Maybe we'll stop there. And until next time, keep listening to your heart song.